What's going on, fanboys and fangirls? Welcome to another Review Point podcast coming to you from fanboysanonymous.com. I'm your host, Tony Mango, and my target to review for this edition is the latest entry in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. We just did our Minuteman review, got that out of the way, so if you want a spoiler-free review, check that one out, because the review point is going to be diving into all the spoiler territory. So I'm warning you ahead of time, if you have not seen the movie yet and you don't want to know what happens, bookmark this, go watch the movie, and then come back. But if you don't really care, or maybe that this is going to be the thing that convinces you whether or not you want to see the movie, because you are one of those people that actually doesn't mind if it gets spoiled, by all means, continue listening on. Just wanted to put that warning out there ahead of time so everybody knows. So let's talk a little bit before we get into the movie itself about Guardians of the Galaxy in general, because I mentioned this on our review the last time around. I mentioned this on our audio commentary track, which we did. Go ahead and check out the fan tracks for the first Guardians of the Galaxy. The film wasn't one of those ones that I really thought was going to be a success. I actually was convinced 100% that this was going to be the first failure, and it was going to be awful, and it was going to prove that they were a little bit too much focused into comedy, and I ended up being dead wrong. I ended up loving Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. It was one of the most fundamentally well-crafted stories out of the MCU. It's not as good as, like, Winter Soldier is or the first Iron Man, but I do think that it's one of the most entertaining, and it's one of the best ones that they have put out so far. So, knowing that information, it's hard not to go into Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 without high expectations. But I tried to sort of mitigate that a little bit, because I check out, say, like, Collider and Screen Junkies and, you know, some other outlets like that, and they all kind of seem to have the same perspective, which was, it's not as good as the first one, and that doesn't mean that it's bad, but if you think that it's going to be as good or that it's going to top it, you're going to be disappointed. And I have to agree, that's pretty much the case here. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is a good movie, but it's not a great movie. And it's not as good as the first one is. So, when you're talking about breaking down the hits and the misses of the review point, it's going to be hard to sort of say something is a miss without it seeming like it's bad. But... What I mean by a miss in this scenario is it just didn't quite live up to the expectations and it could have been better. And in some cases, it might not have just been good in general. But generally speaking, this was more so the hits are the hits. The misses are things that didn't quite get to that level as opposed to just being bad. So keep that in mind. But there's a smattering of hits and misses in this. It's not just leaning one way or the other. And my general perspective of it is that it is an entertaining movie. It's very fun. It's got a lot of great moments to it. And it's the type of thing that I can't imagine that many people disliking. But, you know, I have to admit also, this isn't one that I really think I'm going to be wanting to watch over and over and over again. I said the same thing about the last entry, which was Doctor Strange. Now, Doctor Strange, I've seen a couple times since then, and it's grown on me at least a little bit more, but I still think that it's a little bit weaker than most people think it is. And at the same time, I can pop one, say, Winter Soldier, or I can pop one Civil War even, or the first Guardians, or Iron Man, or a couple other entries in there, And just watch it like it's nothing. I mean, I can put on the Avengers probably four times in a row and still find it fun. So the good thing about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is it's a fundamentally fun movie. So even if the story itself is lacking in some regards, and if the scope of it doesn't quite reach what some of the other ones are, it's still fun, and it's still going to be that sort of mood where maybe I'm in the mood for something a little bit more gripping. And I'll watch, I don't know, one of the more serious ones. And then maybe I want something a little bit goofier, and then I'll watch something like this. But you never really know until you start watching it for a second and a third time and such. And I've only seen it once about an hour ago. So uh, we'll see what happens when it comes down to a couple of months from now when it gets released and stuff. But I want to start things off really with one of the big, big, big hits on the whole thing. The first movie presents Guardians of the Galaxy as a family coming together, and this movie takes it to the next level. It makes it 
what happens when you've been hanging around family members a little bit too much and you're kind of upset with each other and as any family does you argue but it comes from a root of i (laughs) shouldn't have said a root there uh it, it comes from roots of love so you get people that piss you off in your family and you get these arguments that seem really petty when you start looking back on things, but they're going to happen anyway, and they're going to happen even after you think that they're petty, and, you know, it's just what it is what it is. It's like an old married couple that kind of bickers with each other, or your sibling rivalry, which that's another thing I'll talk about in a few minutes or so, but the backbone of this movie is family, and when you take in all the different family members you've got going on, whether it's father-son, or you've got surrogate father and son or brother uh, not brother sister well kind of a little bit brother sister if you look at the way like Gamora and Drax sort of talk to each other where you've got like mother and child with (laughs) Gamora and baby Groot and you've got like the crazy uncle and uh, all the different varieties of family you pretty much have that all in this one the only one that's pretty much an outsider is Mantis but she's a brand new character and she's just sort of you know, finding her uh, finding her footing a little bit at the end of the movie. So next time around, she'll be a little bit more well-rounded and such. But the characters for this movie, without a doubt, make the movie. And if we didn't have that setup ahead of time and that whole other movie where we got to know these characters, we wouldn't be able to have that much fun with them. Because now that we know that these are their family now, it's, I keep hearing Vin Diesel's voice in my head, not saying I am group, but just saying family, you know. Uh, now that we have that ahead of time, though, we can pick apart little bits and pieces. Like, Rocket is a dick, and Peter Quill is a dick, so they're going to be dicks to each other. That's just the way that it is. You get two adversarial rams butting heads, and it's going to end up happening. And you get somebody like Gamora, who is shut off. And she has that relationship with Thanos that fucked her up and she's not really into trusting people and everything. It's going to be hard for her to fall for Peter. Yet Peter is this lovable guy and he kind of is like the optimist of the whole bunch and everything. So he's going to be the one that's sort of smiling a little bit here and there. But I really, really loved the way that they handle a lot of this. And it was surprising in some of the ways how they even did do some of that because... Nebula and Gamora, to me, seemed like they were at odds enough that they shouldn't have been able to reach the conclusion that they reached at this point until the third film. But by the end of this movie, I buy 100% that this was a natural progression where Nebula and Gamora, they're not going to be best buds right now because they've had a traumatic childhood, yet Nebula being the one that has to admit that the reason why they are at odds is because of a little bit of jealousy and Nebula feeling unloved is a great way for them to rekindle that relationship because Gamora is the outsider with her relationship with Peter and if she applied the same things to Nebula and now she kind of knows that maybe she should open herself up a little bit to Peter, open herself up a little bit to Nebula... That is going to be a good healing process, and I really, really liked that idea. That was actually one of my favorite parts of the movie, was seeing Nebula and Gamora become a sisterly unit again. And that they were talking about, you know, kind of like, we we need to kill Thanos, and I don't know if that's possible, and that kind of stuff, because we know that Drax is going to want to kill Thanos. We know that Gamora and Nebula are now totally on board with killing Thanos. He's making some enemies, and he's going to have his uh, work cut out for him when it comes to Infinity War, but then again, he's going to have the Infinity Gauntlet, so he'll kind of snap his fingers, and half of them will be dead anyway. But I really like that. To a lesser extent, and I would say that this isn't a hit as much, but it is sort of, is the Drax and Mantis relationship, because it's good in some ways, and in some other ways it feels like a little bit of filler, and it's maybe rushed a tiny bit. I'm curious how an empath hooks up with somebody who has no filter because you would think that they would just sort of be a little bit too much of a good thing, kind of. And, yeah, I mean, there were some cute moments. The whole idea of you're hideous, and then at the end, uh, you know, he kind of undermines that a little bit with the you're beautiful. But just to get another laugh in there, it's on the inside, I mean, you know, just fucking on the inside, that kind of thing. I liked that. I thought that Mantis was a weird character, but at the same time, I'm not too familiar with a lot of this side of the cosmic Marvel universe. 
So Mantis is a character I honestly did not know anything about going into this. And there's plenty of other characters that are like that too. So when you talk to me about Batman and you bring up, say, Condiment King, I know more about Condiment King than I know about Mantis. And that is weird. So with Marvel adapting certain characters and making some changes, it upsets me if it's in a way that I think is wrong or it's not that I'm used to it because some of the things in the MCU are not quite exactly how I would want them to be. But most of them, if not the vast majority of them, are changes for the better. And I have to imagine that Mantis is a character that if I had read the comics ahead of time, I might be a little bit peeved or so if they weren't kind of doing full-on Mantis. But right now, from my perspective, I know so little about her that this character was totally fine. So I have no nitpicks when it comes to Mantis herself being translated to the big screen. Drax and Mantis' relationship, uh, you know, it's it sort of, it didn't do everything for me, but it did enough. So I can't by any means call that a miss. And I wouldn't even go so far as to say that it's a ricochet. It, it's a hit more than anything. I loved Baby Groot. Who wouldn't? I mean, they even have the line in the movie, it's too adorable to kill. Baby Groot is just fucking cute. And they knew it. They knew full well when you do little scenes of him looking sad and stuff that the whole audience is just going to be like, oh my god, I want to fucking, you know, hug the little thing. <laughs> it's just, it's funny. And I really thought it was funny too as well with uh, Teenage Groot being like playing the video games and having a messy room and all that. That was a really, really nice touch. I liked that a lot. Hopefully Groot will be back to normal by the time we get to Infinity War, which is supposed to take place, I think, three years after this point. So three years from now, Groot should probably be adult Groot again. Young adult Groot, maybe. He's going to be really into uh, Twilight and Divergent and shit. I'm kidding, of course. Nobody's into Divergent. Uh... <laughs> I probably should say the same thing about Twilight, but I know that that's not the case. I've never seen Twilight, though. I've seen Twi uh, Divergent. I don't know why I've bothered watching three of those movies, but... Yeah, you know, whatever. That's another story for another day. Rocket was great, really funny, and sort of the same kind of character as the first time around, which I liked. Good enough. You know, I didn't think that they really needed to change all that much. And they gave him a little bit of heart in this in certain points that were sort of like... Yeah, he's progressing his character. He's starting to get to know the uh, his limits of how much of a jerk he can be without upsetting his family and all that. So I liked Rocket. I think that it was good that they showed him being that the tech guy again. And they really just sort of, you had a couple of points that you can hit with Rocket. I think that they hit them all. Yondu, though. Wow, was I surprised about Yondu. His storyline in this was probably, if... The, if not the Nebula and Gamora one, it's probably the Yondu and Peter one that I liked the best out of this. Because at first I wasn't loving it. Yondu being an outsider with the Ravagers wasn't really all that great. And I'll talk about some of the, the misses with that a little bit later. But his deal with being the surrogate father of Peter, I thought, was vastly better than Ego with Peter. And then, you know what, I might as well get into that miss, too, because Ego was more of a miss than anything else. And uh, Ego is a character I, I knew a little bit about here and there, but I don't know, like, too many specifics about Ego because it's one thing if you watch, like, an animated episode of a TV show that has Ego one time or you read one comic or you read one Wikipedia entry or whatever – but it's another thing to be totally familiar with a character. You know, if you bring out Iron Man, I know more about Iron Man than I know about Ego, that kind of stuff. So translating Ego was something that I kind of feel like they they merged a little bit too much. And it it worked for the movie in the sense that it didn't feel like they were merging too many characters, but knowing that they were merging all these characters was sort of off-putting to me. Since when is Ego in a, uh, some kind of a Celestial? And since when are the Celestials just by themselves? Because he's talking about how he's the only one of them, yet we know for a fact that that's not the case. 
the Celestials were seen not only as that hologram in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 1, but also nowhere was the head of a Celestial. So I'm curious why they decided that he would throw that random line out there about Celestial being his origin instead of just saying that he was an ancient power because he could just be an ancient being and not be a celestial. So if you guys have any ideas of how they might think about clearing that up or specifying the differences between the different celestials and stuff, uh, definitely leave your comments below. I want to hear your thoughts about that. I didn't like the idea that ego was a celestial. And I also sort of don't like the idea that ego was his, uh, his dad, J uh, Jason, I think is how you pronounce it of Spartax. That idea was could have been fine for me. He could have just been an alien that was like very humanoid and all that. And now they sort of did and didn't give Peter this this way out of things a little bit because Peter, to me, from what I do know of him, is not like some power type of guy. And they gave him powers temporarily, but then at the end of it, he said, you know, you, you would be an immortal as long as the light still exists, which what is that light supposed to be, really? Yet at the same time, he loses that power, so he's going to be a, a normal human for the future. I guess this is sort of like having your cake and eating it, too. But I liked Kurt Russell in the role. I like the idea that Kurt Russell was Chris Pratt's father. But I don't really know if I really like Ego. And it's in a couple different ways for the father son relationship was a little bit weird. I do like the idea that he was a dick because if he's going to be a villain for him to say that line about, Oh, you know, really hurt for me to put that tumor in your mom's head. That was like, Oh, you jerk you. You know, that really was a good turning point. Some of the other things were just a little bit strange though. And uh, I, I really liked, by the way, the, visuals of the planet having the actual ego look with like the face in it that was cool i really liked even though it's not something that's like specific about having to like it just the visuals behind him reconstructing his body it looked kind of realistic and stuff and that was pretty cool i didn't really like the villains in this movie though overall if i'm thinking about it because ego was sort of a letdown and the sovereign was just kind of like all they really existed to do was to have some space battles. So that's it. And they're going to maybe continue on into the next movie. And I don't really want to see them continue on into the next movie to a certain extent. I do want to see one person out of that, but not anybody else. Taser face. I'm glad that they made fun of the name because the name is stupid and his look is pretty ridiculous, but I do have to give them a little bit of credit when it comes to the idea that they kept this separately where it wasn't like all three of them get together and they're all going to have this big plot and look at it this way when you get a movie like batman forever where there's really no reason for riddler and two-face to become partners it's odd to see villains team up but if you see a movie like this where the sovereign has their own goals Taserface has its own goals Ego has his own goals and they just happen to be three adversaries in the process of just getting through the movie. It's good and it's bad. The bad part is because you can't have that one solid, we're all going to survive. We're all going to beat the bad guys type of moment. But then do you really want to see Taserface last that long? Or do you just want him to be a side villain? So it works like that. Yet, you know, I can't give it a full hit because I didn't really like any three of them. So it gets a ricochet. It's not a miss. It's not a hit. I will say that when I go back to the whole relationship with Yondu and everything, Yondu and Kraglin, that was a good relationship because I was really kind of disappointed that Kraglin was going against Yondu. And then I was really happy when he went back into the mix and he worked and found his way to sort of repent a little bit. But Yondu and Peter, who would have thought in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, I would have gotten to a point where I was like, oh man, I'm getting a little bit upset about this. Like, I don't want Yondu to die because Yondu's a, a jerk. And that idea that he sort of, he loved Peter as like a surrogate father and that he was this Hasselhoff, that kind of a thing. That was really nice. I liked that a lot. 
So now both movies towards the end had a scene where I was just like, oh, crap, I'm getting a little uh, clumped here. The first one, by the way, was the one with the uh, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. That was the one that kind of got me going, like, oh, man, I'm getting a little a little something worked up in here. Uh, the Craglin yondu relationship is kind of like a younger brother sort of a thing or like a mentor, mentee. And that was nice to see. And I'm kind of curious where they're going to bring Craglin into the future because I think that Sean Gunn more than likely will pop up in the third one. But is he going to be like just in one scene where he's going to bump into them and they're going to need his help? He's going to be running a new unit of the Ravagers or something like that? I don't know. I kind of would like to see Craglin again, though. Yandu having a send off as well as he did with like a Viking funeral, so to speak, was really nice, though. I like that a lot. That was a big, big hit for me. Visual effects were fantastic. Outside of a couple of shots, that looked a little bit fake. There was one in particular where Peter's being sucked backward, and that looked like it was a green screen effect. But for the most part, I mean, the movie looks beautiful in a lot of different ways. And the 3D didn't bug me. I usually don't really like 3D, and I didn't get any headaches at this point. I, I don't normally get headaches. I don't even know why I, I said that out loud. So don't look at that as sort of like, this is a headache guy, and he always complains about 3Ds. It's never been really an issue for me, but... Sometimes I think that it's a little pointless, and I didn't notice it in this time. So at the, I guess you could kind of say I thought it was pointless because it was just a waste of like four extra bucks. Yet, uh, eh, you know, whatever. That's best time that I could get the tickets for, right? Big, big, big hit for me. Stan Lee is involved with the Watchers. That is awesome, man. So many people, myself included, were looking at the idea of Stanley possibly being a watcher, or in my mind, I thought it would have made a little bit more sense for him to be the one above all, because that would be a nice way to end Infinity War if they just sort of have, like, if they still might do it, too, that's the thing. He still might be the one above all, but he was talking to the watchers and stuff, and I still think the best way to end Infinity War is... If you had to pick one person to do it, pick Captain America. But one person or a bunch of them or whatever, they get the Infinity Gauntlet, they reverse all the damage that happens during Infinity War, and there is kind of a soft reboot of the universe a little bit. Some of the things get fixed over time, some of the things get recast, you know, whatever. And they just, they have a conversation with Stan Lee. And he says, you know, like, hey, this is the comic book world. Some things change, some things stay the same, and you guys have the right idea here, and he kind of proves that he's the one above all, and he's just sort of like, there's an issue with Fantastic Four where they meet Jack Kirby, and he's the one above all, and he, he like, erases a problem with the thing, I think, and then he basically tells him, like, you're doing good work, go at it, and that would be kind of a cool way for that to be the end of kind of the Stan Lee speculation. He's just, he's one of all, and he's popping up here and there. He's speculating and he's watching stuff and whatever. So I do love, absolutely loved that the watchers were in here because first off, they looked like the watchers. So that was cool. That also means that there's a little bit more flexibility when it comes to Fox characters, because the watchers, if I remember correctly, were in that group with the fantastic four. So maybe just maybe, we have some kind of a deal worked out with Fox where Fantastic Four characters like Kang and Annihilus and Silver Surfer and Galactus, maybe they are under the Marvel wing now. I really, really hope that's the case because Fox does not know what the hell they're doing with this. And those characters don't necessarily have to come into play for years down the line. Yet I want to see Galactus go up against our people. I want to see Doctor Strange refer to... Silver Surfer, in a way. I want to see the Fantastic Four done well. That kind of stuff. Speaking of cameos, Adam Warlock reference at the end. Never was the biggest fan of Adam Warlock, but that's cool that they're bringing him into the mix. Not sure if I like the idea of him possibly being the villain of the third film. I'd rather see somebody else be the villain, but we'll see what happens with that. Howard the Duck popping up again. That was pretty funny. A little Cosmo in the credits, too. I think that Action-wise, it's about 50-50 for the movie. There was a good chunk of it that wasn't really being focused on as other things were kind of intercut through the action, and that hurts it. Because, say, the first part of the movie, where they're doing the whole sequence with fighting whatever that tentacled creature is and stuff, 
you end up focusing the entire time on dancing Groot. And that got a little bit old. So by the time the end, uh, opening credits were done, I really didn't want to see any more dancing Groot anymore. I really wanted to just see what was going on with the action. That hurts it, but the action that we do see is fun. It's well shot. Everything's cool like that. But let's get into some negatives here. I uh, might catch some flack for this, but I didn't like the music. I really just... Nothing hit me the way that it did the first time. I honestly can't tell you any songs that were in this movie, and I just got done watching it, which sucks, because, I mean, Come and Get Your Love was a song that I was never the biggest fan of, and watch Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 and instantly love it. And I can't tell you, really, like, I I'm struggling to think right now of what songs were in the movie. And maybe it's just those particular songs that they just don't hit with me because I'm not familiar with them or something, but none of them are standing out in my brain right now. So that's a definite downer. That's a definite miss. I mentioned Ego being a miss in a lot of different ways. I didn't like the idea that he was a celestial. That's kind of bugging me. I had heard that there was an overabundance of humor, and I kind of agree to a, well, at least a little bit of an extent. Some jokes were sort of like, you didn't really need a joke there necessarily. Like, I didn't think that Mantis needed to get hit by something, but, uh, you know, whatever. And I, it's lost on me, but the cameos of the whole Stakar Ogward, Sylvester Stallone's character, Ving Rhames playing Charlie 27, and Michelle Yeoh as Aleta, or Alita, or whatever. That is so over my head, so I can't call that a miss. Because that's not their fault. If I was really familiar with it, I'm sure I would have been like, oh my god, Martin X, or Martin X, or whatever you pronounce it. I don't even know how to pronounce the name. Or Mainframe. Whatever. I I don't really know what those type of characters are. So, um, that's kind of a miss a little bit, sort of. It seems like they're setting up the idea of that maybe they would want to do a Ravagers movie. And I don't really want to see a Ravagers movie with Sylvester Stallone. Because I think that there's so much better stuff that you could devote your resources to. And if they spent all that time and money to do a Ravager spinoff, I think I would have been a little bit annoyed that we didn't get something like, oh, I don't know, Quasar even. I'm not a big fan of Qu uh, Quasar either, but give me like Agents of Sword instead. By the way, speaking of cameos, where was Nathan Fillion in this? Because he was supposed to be Wonder Man, wasn't he? Didn't see Wonder Man in the mix. So I'm curious what happens with that. But all in all, when it comes to this movie, I mean, we're about like that half hour mark right now. So it's about enough time for me to shut up talking about this and kind of let you guys get your own opinions out there. But my biggest miss is probably that the spectacle of the whole thing just didn't feel like it was as great as the first one did. But my biggest hit is the characters interacting with each other and really just proving that that family unit is tight with this. They really know that how to hit those characters' moments in whatever ways that they need to, whether it's some kind of a humor punch or some kind of a heart punch, and it works. So I'm digging that a lot, and Guardians of the, Gal uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is not going to be in my top five favorite Marvel movies, yet it's not going to be one of the ones at the very, very bottom either couple more times to see in the movie and give me a little bit better of an idea of where I would rank it. But right now, fun movie, very funny, very entertaining. A little bit weak on the movie aspect of it. Yet, as far as you look at a movie like Iron Man 2, not as good as Iron Man 1, yet it did a lot to build towards the future. I think Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is sort of in the same regard, where it isn't fundamentally as good of a movie but we're going to look back afterward and we're going to really appreciate how much they did for setting up the idea of like just space in general and how to keep the cosmos going in the future and making you feel a little bit more familiar with the way that the marvel cosmic universe is going to be working going forward this is going to do a lot for the future so you know what i think if we get a b minus movie that sets up a couple of B plus and A minus and A plus movies. It's all the much better for it. This is a series of movies. 
not individual films from a filmmaker. Let's put it that way, because if you look at something like the Christopher Nolan films, The Prestige is not as good as The Dark Knight, and it has nothing to do with The Dark Knight. So when you look at those two and you go, well, The Dark Knight has Batman Begins and Dark Knight Rises wasn't as good as the other two, but those three movies are a unit and they all depend on each other. Interstellar, where my favorite out of his movies probably is Inception. Oh, well, I, I can't count that. Batman Begins is my favorite. Dark Knight's number two, and then Inception's number three. Let's, let's be honest here. But Memento is number four, by the way. And, uh, Something as good as Memento is not hurt by Interstellar not being as good. Yet, in a Marvel Cinematic Universe way, a bad movie can hurt the whole franchise. And I'd rather take a little bit of a bullet to make sure that the rest of the series is held up than to have a movie that standalone is very good and it hurts the rest of it. So keep that in mind if you are on the fence when it comes to this. Which one do you value better? Do you value the sum of the parts or do you value each individual one? I value the sum of the uh, whole thing and I think that this is going to do a lot for the future. So gets a big old thumbs up from me. Not as enthusiastic of a thumbs up as I was hoping it to be, but it's still going to get a thumbs up nonetheless. So that's my rundown for this episode of Review Point. If you're wondering whether it's a hit or a miss, it's a hit. But I want to know what you guys have to say about this. So share your thoughts with me in the comments below. Tell me what you like, what you didn't like, anything in between like that. Stay tuned to the website and the YouTube channel for more stuff coming your way. Just hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can get notified of anything else that pops up that way. And uh, I want to thank you all for listening to this, everybody. I'm Tony Mango, and I'm a fanboy. See you next time. Geeks out.